In the previous two chapters of our three-part interview with drummer Rod Morgenstein, we discussed his influences, attending the University of Miami, where he met guitarist Steve Morris to eventually form the Dixie Dregs, and we talk about the band's history and their last reunion in 2018 and what lies ahead. In part three, we talk about Rod's desire to change his direction of music in 1987 and went to New York City landing auditions that didn't pan out. And by chance, Rod was at a studio and walked past a band that was practicing that needed a drummer. Rod fit right in. The next year, the band was named Winger and had a record deal. The band is still touring and recently released their current album, Seven. So how did you hook, hook up with Kip? Winger. It's another one of those things that was not, <laughs> it was not on the agenda, right? It was not an intended meeting. I found my way into a Japanese management company's office. They're, they're called Amuse America. And at the time they were managing a new age artist by the name of Kitaro, who in the 80s was a very big new age artist. They asked me to come to their office to talk about the tour. The manager said, I feel terrible. Kitaro is in LA. He flew from Japan to LA and he's decided to work with LA-based musicians. So the gig is not available. So I was disappointed, um, but I said, thank you very much. Can you just sort of keep my name and number if and when some other opportunity arises? So as he's walking me out of the office, I heard some rock music coming from a room. The door was closed. And the, the manager said, we're trying to help them get a record deal. They've been rejected twice by every label. They're writing and recording music for a third go around. They open the door and it's Kip Winger, who I don't know, and Reb Beach, the guitarist, the, you know, the, the main lead guitarist uh, in what would become Winger. And it was a very funny meeting because Reb was so excited because the drummer from the Dixie Dregs was in the room <laughs> with him. He was a Dregs fanatic and a Steve Morris disciple. Wow. And he was almost like shaking, going, Kip, you don't know who this is. This is the drummer from the Dixie Dregs. You know, and um, Kip's like shrugging his shoulders and look, I don't know who you are. Look at Reb, he's, you know, <laughs> like, a, like a excited, Girl, right now you have to remember i'm an unemployed musician that in reb's eyes you know <laughs> like i'm the drummer from the the great dixie dregs i'm looking for a gig and kip doesn't know who the hell i am so and i do remember the song that was playing was the demo version of the song madeleine that a year later was the first single from the first winger album kip said we are going to keep writing music and doing demos and shopping for record deals until we get signed. We're not stopping. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I have a list of the 20 to 30 New York drummers that go to every cattle call audition. And they're the drummers that I was going to call to audition when, uh, when we get a bite from a record label. But, you know, Reb is so excited <laughs> want it, you want to get together and jam in the next few days? So I said, sure, of course I do. So that's how I got involved with Kip and Reb. Now, when I went to the audition, this was funny. I had had some interesting jamming experiences with various musicians in New York City in the year that I had been there, learning that I basically was very immature. Here I was, 33 years old, I had no respect for, you know, the basics of rock, hard hitting, keeping it simple, playing the same kick snare patterns that have been played for the decades that rock music had been around. But I, I had no respect for those grooves because I felt if you can hear a song and you know what the board changes are and you know what the drummer's doing as it's happening the first time, that's really stupid and boring. <laughs> that was my immature attitude then. There's a reason why the same tried and true patterns and, and riffs and notes are used over and over again. It's because they are at the core of what makes rock and roll tick. You don't get it. So I, 
I had some learning experiences leading up to my, what became my audition, you know, for Kip and Reb. And so when I walked in the door to the audition, I made sure to leave all of my jazz fusion chops in the hall. And I said, no matter what they do, I'm just gonna hit the drums as hard as I've ever hit them. I'm not even gonna play drum fills. I'm just gonna oom, pa, oom, pa, the whole time. Right. So Kip walks up to me and starts pumping eighth notes on the bass. So I go, doom, pa, doom, pa, that's it, you know, nothing else. Right. The hi hats are sloshing, I'm cracking rim shots. You know, I'm playing so hard, it's hurting me. But I want him to think I'm like this rock and roll drummer, you know? John Bottom. <laughs> harder, hitting harder. So um, and he stops and he says, what are you doing? I said, you're, you're pumping drum, 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 drum on the bass. So I'm playing what I think's appropriate. He goes, yeah, 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 I see. It's great. You hit hard. And play simple, but Reb told me you could do crazy stuff. I said, well, I'm intentionally not doing it because I don't, I don't want to scare you away. I didn't think that's what you're interested in. He said, well, no, what I'm interested in is being a band that will be lumped into the same group of bands as Kiss and Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and Poison and Cinderella. Um, and Motley Crue, but I want us to have elements in our band that none of those bands have. Yep. And one of the possible things we could have is a drummer who knows how to rock, but who also knows how to play over the bar line and throw in polyrhythms and do the weird stuff that rock drummers don't do or don't know how to do. And I said, are you kidding me? You're asking me? And not just straight 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> Exactly. So he said, I want you to lose me. I said, you're, you're serious. All right, I'm going to get weird on you. He goes, go for it. And we had the best time. The best time. And so at the end of it, he said, all right, I'm going to call you. So we get a deal. And that's how I got the winger gig. Hey, you know, so you know, I said um, when I failed those four or five auditions, when I first moved to New York, um, I think they were for different reasons. When I walked into the Billy Idol audition, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon in New York City. I think I was probably wearing like a Sam Ash t-shirt or, or a Manny's t-shirt or, you know, <laughs> um, jeans that I got from The Gap and like regular, you know, like, like dressed like a regular goofball person, not dressed like a rock star. Right? And right, so right. so I walked in there and there's Billy Idol sneering, you know, with his leather jacket with fringes and black leather pants and boots and jewelry everywhere, and, you, know, <laughs> you know, with the, the hair, you could tell, probably spent an hour. The band looked like they were ready to take the stage. That's my point. So it's like, holy cow, this band lives the life. It's not like, wow. They're dressed in their Manny's t-shirts and Gap jeans until it's showtime. And then they put on the stage costumes. You know, it's like, oh, they wake up in the morning. <laughs> they're just walking the streets of New York. They're they're dressed to kill. What did you say that? To say. And so I felt like before <laughs> I even played a note, they looked at me and went, look at look at this character. <laughs> Look how goofy he looks. And image is so huge in pop culture. It's not just about how you play. Right. Yeah. And Winger, we're going to be a full-time band again. Um, we played a show a month ago in Corbin, Kentucky. It was our first show in 13 months. Um, the promoter rescheduled the show from December to March and refused to cancel it. It's fantastic. We played with two bands from back in that 80s era, um, the Bullet Boys and Firehouse. And uh, they allowed a little over 2,000 people in the venue. That was wonderful. We're, we're in the process of recording a new winger album. 
and um, everybody in the band is very close. This band is like a family. You know, we hear the the war stories in certain bands, how basically they meet on stage, they do the show, and then <laughs> they disperse. We we are a band who um, likes to do things together. You know, we eat meals together, we hang out. A quick story, because Robert Plant is my favorite singer. Uh, he was my wife's favorite singer, God rest her soul. So my wife, Michelle, um, I, she battled breast cancer for 22 years, okay? And so after one of her chemotherapy treatments, I took her to the Nassau Coliseum on Long Island to see Robert Plant. The opening act was Mr. Big, <laughs> Billy Sheehan. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. <laughs> And so, so my wife, Michelle, she had the biggest crush on Robert Plant, right? And so, so she and I uh, had gotten backstage passes. We were on the side of the stage on the floor level, stage right, floor level. The stage was probably 15 feet in the air, but she and I were the only two people standing where we were standing. And so Robert Plant, you know, walks back and forth, side to side, so he can, convene with the audience. And when he came to our side of the stage, he did that that famous bow that he does. And he did it to my wife. And I was watching him watching her and watching her watching him. And you know, out of the corner of her mouth, she was saying, are you, are you seeing this? Is this really happening? I said, it is, it is totally happening. That this is cool. Is, that's, a, that's OK. This is awesome, right? All right, so he's both our favorite singer, right? So when the night was over, I went back to say hi to um, to everybody in Mr. Big, because we had done some shows together, Winger and Mr. Big, like some months prior. Mr. Big's tour manager comes over to me. His name was Sandy. And he goes, Rod, you're not going to believe it. I go, what? He goes, several months ago, I got a phone call well, our management office, Herbie Herbert Management, who also managed Santana and Journey at the time, we got a phone call from Robert Plant's management looking for you. He said, looking for me? He said, yeah, but they didn't have a phone number for you. Robert needed a drummer for his tour because his drummer was horsing around in the shower, <laughs> broke some bone, and they needed a drummer immediately. But I told Robert Plant's manager that you weren't available because you were with Winger. So Mr. Big's drummer, Pat Torpy, did the tour. Ah, oh, wow. That's got lo I love Pat Torpy, God rest his soul. What a sweet human being and what an amazing drummer, gifted, gifted musician. But Pat did the tour. Wow, I mean, man, that must have been a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm sure I love just even thinking about the fact that my name even circled within the Robert Plant world, you know? Thanks, Rod, for talking with Music Explorer today, and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Had a lot of fun. Okay, and I'll talk to you soon. Excellent.